Our esteemed guest is actor Jeremy Swift, and many of you who are big fans of Downton Abbey, where he played Mr. Spratt, Dame Maggie Smith's butler, and Leslie Higgins in Ted Lasso, you're in for a treat. He is here tonight, and he has been seen in Mary Poppins Returns, directed by Rob Marshall for Disney, and Jeremy has also worked with legendary film directors such as Roman Polanski and Oliver Twist, Robert Altman in Gosford Park, and the Wachowski siblings in Juniper Ascending. And how many of you remember seeing Jeremy in Fred Claus? Now there's a bit of trivia. And finally, we have been waiting and waiting and waiting for the return of Ted Lasso, and it's finally here. Let's welcome award-winning actor extraordinaire, the one and the only Jeremy Swift. Thank you very much. Great to be on the show. Thanks well, for having me. Oh, oh, absolutely. And now I have been a big Ted Lasso fan since episode one. So why did it take so long for season three of Ted Lasso to finally debut? Well, um, there was a bit of back and forth on the scripts and there was a lot of finessing. Um, and, you know, Jason in particular is a perfectionist and I just hope that everybody feels it'll be worth it. Um, you know, there are, there are a lot of stories to that run in the show. The, there are many characters. It's, it's like got as many characters as a Tolstoy novel. You know, uh, anybody can sort of uh, surface and enter into the story and become a real key component in it. And um, and there are a lot of nuances in within the the relationships and the characters. So there's a lot of stuff to address. <laughs> and I think they wanted to do it as as well as they possibly could. Now, are you surprised? Because I the writing is absolutely stellar, and like you said, there are. There are so many characters in this series, but each character really seems to have their own storyline within this series. How did Jason and the other producer and writers make it work so well? I think they're very careful not to just have ciphers, you know, not just to have a cliched abrupt man, you know, Ted meets abrupt man or, you know, sort of rude woman on street. There's always something else going on with those characters, which just gives them another dimension. And it, it's to their it's to their credit that they give everybody that level of humanity. Well, and it's show. amazing how the writing of Ted Lasso with all of these characters that, you know, as a fan of the series, we literally remember every storyline of every every character and how they intersect with with such fluidity. It's it's incredible. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's that's again great writing that that, that everything links up, so you, you remember it clearly and you you take it on board. You know. Well, yeah. Um, well, how much did the pandemic disrupt the filming of Ted Lasso? Uh, good question. Uh, season two, we, we just got on with it. Um, we had, uh, I think an eight strong COVID team, uh, and we wore masks the, un unless we were acting or eating, uh, we were wearing masks even outside. Uh, and you know, sometimes you'd forget and your mask would slip and, you know, they'd go, Jeremy, I can see your nose. And um, uh, so, yeah, well, you know, God bless them. They kept us all safe. And we, um, I, I got, I did get COVID during that season um, from my grandson, actually. But it, with Ted Lasso luck, I had a 10 day break. So I had it. I was ill. I recovered. I was clear. I was back. <laughs> <laughs> wow, now th that's a, that's a perfect miracle right there. And I have been reading yeah. uh and and I love the tra the trailer is the perfect teaser for season 3. And it looks like it's going to take us on a roller coaster ride now that it seems to be Ted versus Nate. What are the viewers going to expect there? Well, there are, yeah, it's the, the, the battle lines have, are, are being drawn in, you, in the first two episodes um, and people are regrouping and that's, that's fun. It's a lot of fun. Um, 
And I really feel that the show, having watched the first two episodes two nights ago, it feels like it's in a mega stride now. You know, as you say, everybody has been watching it and we know all those nuances and the, uh, the, the writers know that, so they're just sweeping everybody along. I mean, you know, it was pretty fast out of the tracks from the get-go, this show, and people took to it immediately. And now it's just it's just running with it, well, um, you know. Are you surprised how loyal the Ted Lasso fan base has become? I mean, people are literally been waiting for season three like they've been waiting for season four of Stranger Things. You're right. Yeah. No, I, I feel very honored and privileged that, you know, people just love the show so much. I mean, I did say to my uh, agent the other day, I said, I I'm slightly worried that, you know, we're going to lose them, that people just move on and go, well, actually, this is my show now. Forget you, Ted Lasso, you, you, you dropped us. Um, but, I, you know, my agent reminded me that, you know, between, you know, a very different aesthetic entirely, The Sopranos, there were sometimes two year gaps between those seasons. People still hung on in there. They wanted to know what was going to happen to that family. It's so, it um, almost, uh, yeah, it almost feels like a two year wait for season three. Yeah, yeah, it's, I think it's, uh, yeah. 20 months, <laughs> possibly. Yeah, I mean, because yeah, we clever. would, yeah, because we would get, you know, the, you, you would hear online like, hey, Ted Lasso's coming out this summer. Ted Lasso's coming out in the fall. And you keep looking for the, the debut date. And then finally, we hear that it's coming March 15th. So we know it's actually happening. And uh, yeah. I mean, I, for one, literally cannot wait to see this. But for you and the rest of the cast, what did you think of Nate becoming a villain in the show? It's a great idea because it, it what the show addresses is you know, mental health, well-being. It's an underlying theme um, that, that affects a, a lot of characters. And, you know, the old uh, trope, in a way, hurt people, hurt people. That's what manifests in Nate's character. And it's a, just a very interesting dynamic that somebody who is very positive, um, like Ted, can come along, lift somebody up, and they can't take it. And why can't they take it? You know, and I think that's a, a, it's a very, it's a great cliffhanger for for the show it you know for for the end of season two rather than just going wrapping things up and going well we'll we'll bring you more you know gags next time folks you know it just you, you know it just pulls you in well you bring up right, the mental health aspect and i was i was very pleased and actually surprised because with season one you know we see ted he's all happy he's jovial he's almost too nice but in a world of so much negativity, everybody gravitated to Ted Lasso because they're like, oh, if everybody could just be that nice. But then we see the behind the scenes storyline of the struggles that Ted has privately. And that really brought it home that a lot of people today, they may smile in front of others, but they're wearing a mask. Yeah. Exactly. I love the mental health aspect of the show. It's it's very subtle, but at the same time, we we see it very very clearly, and I think it help. I think it helps people to know that yeah, we go out, we put the smile on our face, but for a lot of people out there, they're wearing that mask to cover up the pain that they deal with privately. Absolutely, yeah, uh, and you hear, you know, that that's people people are doing that because they they can't talk about it they can't talk about what is eating them up inside and so that's what they present um and uh yeah we it, it, it takes a probing person to say you okay what's really going on you know that's that's one of the most difficult questions to ask isn't it and it's one of the most difficult questions to deal with yeah you know and 
you know, it's amazing, and you probably find it amazing too, because Ted Lasso really, re you know, when it came out of the box, it really surprised a lot of people because yeah. it wasn't your action flick. It wasn't a cop drama. It was quirky, but there was this very uplifting, nice spirit to the whole show that just drew people in like a magnet. I mean, what have the fans told you? Well, wow. They, they write and say, you know, the most heartfelt things and are very open um, and say, you know, this has brought me joy. Thank you. And, you know, it's, it's really, really sort of touching. It's a, uh, um, uh, yeah, I, I mean, I don't. I, do, I just feel like a performer in it. You know, I'm not a creator of the show and the and the aesthetic. Um, I, 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 you know, you inevitably bring something of the aesthetic in your personality, even if you're even if you're playing a character. You can bring you will bring something, I guess. But there are an amazing and I, I, and that it's that it helped people. I mean, particularly in the. Um, you know, of course, it wasn't the, the show's intention to be a sort of balm and a, and a, a last plast for people, but it was because of what happened in the pandemic, and um, the the world was a pretty bad place anyway before that. But of course, it it was so heightened uh, during that time, and um, the fact that it helped people. Um, you know, we did an interview with a guy a year or so ago. He had cancer. He said it really helped him watching the show. It was, it was like, I'm so, so touched and, and honored to hear that, you know, and, and, and that if it did that, I mean, that I mean a show that can help people, you know, inadvertently <laughs> with their, with their health and their well being. That's amazing. You know, yeah. we would, I would just, just came along for the, the giggles, you know, really. But doing that as well, wow, great. Well, and, you know, one of the storylines in season two was the uh, counselor that really started probing Ted where he finally gave in to sit down with her. And the relationship between those two really grew because there was a lot of friction in the beginning but then they came to love and respect each other. And uh, because, you know, Ted, he finally, you know, took the mask off and I guess really allowed the healing to begin. And I think just that storyline alone helped the millions of people because, you know, we heard during the pandemic that more people dealt with mental health issues than, in, than any other time. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, I'm sure that's that has to be the case. It affected everybody in that way. Um, whether you whether you you know you suffered on uh, physically or not, be, or, you know. But yeah, I I, I think that development of, the, of the, the relationship between them, as you say, was started off as uh, he started off rebuffing her with humor. And um, then she started to get under his skin a bit, and then he realized he needed her. And and then it became towards the end he didn't want her to go, and she and she sort of, uh, you know, she wrote him a letter, and he tried to avoid it. It, it became like family in a way. It became so close that he could be <laughs> he could be cross with her. It was such a fantastic trajectory of, of the, the relationship between them. Yeah, and Sarah. I mean, no. Yeah, because he uh, lost his security blanket. Yes, absolutely. You know, and, and that's, yeah. that's how I saw it. And so for you, where is the character Leslie Higgins? Uh, where is he placed in season three? Well, he has been elevated from season one to season two for you people who've been watching it uh, from a kind of obsequious treading on eggshells kind of character to someone who has been rewarded with, um, you know, s s some, uh, a platform to, to be himself and to operate comfortably. Um, so he continues that pretty much. I mean, he isn't, you know, I am the granddad of the show. Um, 
so he's a relatively stable character um once you know once the work is in place uh so he, he he's in workplace mode quite a lot of the times he he works hard for the club and he tries to develop stuff for the club and um some of it works and um some of it doesn't um and you know he's although he, he you know there are some things he, he has strengths rebecca pushes him into areas where he doesn't really have any strengths and he should really sort of farm out some of his work a little bit so that's but that always makes for comedy so we need that well in season two uh your character got fired what was the fans reaction to that because i was like no hire him back bring him back we need him what did the fans yeah, say see- the, well, yeah, they understood it. That was that was in season one, um, uh, where he where he walked because her vendetta was eating him up, and he just couldn't be a co-conspirator, and he was he was a terrible secret agent. So um, it's not something he could do, you know. Uh, he stuck it out for as long as he could because he has, as you see, uh, a, a, you know five kids uh so um you know he's got mouths to feed but you know enough was enough but well, the, the fact i think the fans were on on the leslie's side yeah definitely yeah now are we going to see a season four i really couldn't say nobody knows um all i can say is if this is it you, you know Sometimes things are just left small and perfectly formed, you know. Although it's not small, it's a huge show. I just mean, it, oh yeah, you know, numbers yeah, because I know, yeah, because I know Hannah uh, Waddington. Uh, what? She had said in an article where she doesn't want to see Ted Lasso end. Um, it, it, it's as if it came too quickly. Um, not only with the success, but you know, three seasons is. It's kind of short, by, uh, but I understand from the very beginning they wrote this as a three-season series. But hopefully the fans will show uh, a strong, a, a much stronger love for it more than ever, and hopefully we'll see more Ted Lasso seasons ahead. Who knows? Um, but what we've got for the moment is a fabulous thing, and uh, I hope people will always relish it. Oh, absolutely. Well, let me ask you this, because you worked for both Roman Polanski and Robert Altman. How did their directing differ from one another? Ha! Um, r- wow. Robert is was uh, such a great man. Another Kansas man, of course. Um, and uh, he said to us quite early on and and it, the the same thing funnily applies to to Ted Lasso he said that whoever is on the screen at the time is the star of the movie and you kind of feel that uh generous Kansas spirit uh in Ted Lasso I think as well uh I, I think uh, I think Robert Altman was a, a, an amazing director and for me one of his he was such an innovator in so many ways but the way that he got people to talk over each other naturally crossing over dialogue was 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 a, just a fantastic innovation because when you i think on a musical level when you hear people speaking like that and they cross over you're drawn in you're drawn into the drama and you're drawn into the comedy it's got it's got a real pulse to it um, even if you don't get every single word, you get the dynamic, you know what's going on. And he would really push for that. Um, uh, he'd have to remind people because, you know, there were so many actors who were used to, well, you get your cue from the sound team who go, please don't overlap. We've got to edit that later on. And you, and ever since uh, I've worked with Robert Altman, I <laughs> say, I've worked with Robert Altman. You can fix it in post. <laughs> Um, um, he, he was, he was fantastic. And, um, I'm so proud to be in that movie. 
Yeah. Well, how did you? So, how do you compare the way he works a film compared to Roman Polanski? Uh, Roman would really, really push for each scene. He would, he would really get in there with the with the actors, um, uh, and he would, you know. I had to run as Mr. Bumble. I had to appear somewhere. I'd run with another kid. <laughs> and we ran around the studio for like, and I was wearing a fat costume and like layers of, you know, Victorian clothes and run around the studio for like half an hour until I was pretty breathless. <laughs> um, and he, he, you know, he gets what, he really gets what he wants. And, um, He's, you know, as you can imagine, not a sentimental uh, director, but a very interesting person. Somebody who speaks something like six languages and he would have, you know, a Polish DP. Um, he'd be uh, thinking in Polish, speaking in French, talking to British actors. Um, so he was, um, he's, he was like a little dynamite, you know, little sort of fuse box. Well, you had an interesting audition with him, didn't you? Oh, I don't know whether you knew about that. Well, I, I, I um, when I went for the casting, um, the um, it, because you know he couldn't leave the country, so I didn't meet him. I did. I did uh, met the casting director, and when I went in there, she just had a phone call from his team saying that he couldn't hear people properly in the audition tapes, so. They didn't say anything to me. I just overheard their conversation. So, uh, and then they went, okay, Jeremy, let's do your piece. So <laughs> I just belted it out as if I was in a huge auditorium, basically. Um, uh, so I don't know whether that helped <laughs> that he could hear what I was saying. Yeah, but wasn't it where he, when you did the audition, he was it where he told you to tone it down or turn it back up even oh. more? Is that what that was about? That was the actual, that was the read through. Oh, wow. How did you get your information? That's fantastic. Called no, research. Was, we had a read through. <laughs> I am, um, yes, the, I was the first person to speak in the film, I think, after, after the person who reads the screen directions in the read through. Okay, so, um, uh, and then, and he said, um, <laughs> I, I think we'll start again because it's all very over the top. And and uh, I thought, I'm the only person who's spoken so far. <laughs> and then, uh, yeah, and then, yeah, um, uh, to the hilarity of all the other actors who were winking at me, he, about halfway through the, the, the read through, he said, Jeremy, bring it up a bit more. Bring it up. Said, okay. <laughs> Well, what's it like doing a read through with someone like Roman Polanski and then finally stepping in front of the camera to do the to do the part? Well, I, on that movie, I was on the first day and <clears throat> the last day and it overran somewhat. Uh, so I did feel very much part. Of, I think if you're there on the first day, you're kind of um, you're, you know, virgin like along with everybody else um uh i just i think by what was i 43 or something i was sort of old and ugly enough to kind of just go with whatever flow happens you know um as long as people weren't having you know kicking down the set kind of tantrums i uh, i can go along with it you know but uh so but no it was it was it was exciting, to be honest. It was really, really exciting. Yeah, you have worked with some incredible people. I mean, how did the part for Mr. Spratt come about on Downton Abbey? Uh, that came about because uh, I think they've been looking for the character for a while. And then I was just offered it uh, by the director um, of that particular episode, who was called David Evans. And I'd worked with him on TV about six times uh and he's a fantastic director and i um i hadn't really seen the show very much um, um 
and I looked at the script and it was only two scenes and I thought, okay, I, I, looking back, why did you even doubt that you might do it? But uh, I thought, well, it's a very big show, I suppose, but two scenes, okay. Um, so, so I did it and I did it with no um, promise of any further episodes at all. Um, it's just that episodes would be sent to me and I would look through them and sometimes I was in them and sometimes I wasn't. Uh, I wouldn't, I was never told, you know, quite often you get a contract and, you know, you'll know that you will be in at least, you know, six out of 12 or whatever. I had no idea. Had no well, idea did you learn that. anything from Dame Maggie Smith? Um, well, I'd worked with her before on Gosford Park, actually. I'd met her then. Um, I learned how to play uh, bana Bananagram, <laughs> which I did with her and Penelope Wilton. Um, and that was, um, I think in about the second scene I did with them, there was a break in this, and they said, would you like to come and play Bananagram with us? I think so, yes. Um, so um, that's what I learned. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Now, I also understand that you're an accomplished jazz musician. When did you get interested in music? Oh, um, my parents were music teachers. Um, they played instruments and um, I, yeah, I got, I, got I, I started playing when I was about eight or nine, piano and guitar, and then I played the, vi learned the violin. <clears throat> um, it's difficult to juggle a number of instruments. My violin playing is now terrible, um, but I've been learning the uh, the double bass for about sort of seven or eight years, and I've got into that. Um, a friend of mine was going to America, and he had a double bass, and um, I said, "Can I buy it off you?" And he and he said, "Yeah." So uh, I, I I mucked about with it for a bit, and then I thought. This, this isn't right. I need lessons. So I started having, you know, tuition. And you played it and in it, Ted Lasso. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, it came, ended up coming into the show. <laughs> well, now I understand that last, last November, you released a brand new single called Wonderland. Uh, what is that about? And I have listened to it, by the way, Jeremy. And... Uh, a lot of production to that, and I was really surprised on how talented you are in that area. Oh, thank you very much. Um, well, I I did produce my first album myself, and I am responsible for most of the production, but I have got a fantastic producer as well, um, finessing uh, on, on this, because I've been working on an album for about two years. Um, the, the song is about where is, you know, where is home, and... It made me think a lot about, uh, you know, I'd, be, I'd thought a lot about, you know, in, in, in the UK, we have a lot of people crossing the channel, people sort of um, dispossessed people from, um, you know, Afghanistan and war-torn countries and, you know, looking for this utopia and will they ever find it? So that was the kind of my idea about it. Um, uh, however, I, I had some video makers who just did a really great, <laughs> crazy wacky video for it which doesn't really sort of go into that but um the the, the my my backstory for the the song but i think it still works in a in a you know very different way <laughs> it does I, you know when i was listening to the song i kept thinking this would actually work for a movie soundtrack there's just this sound that you've created with this song Wonderland. And I'm thinking, I could hear this in the background in a movie. There's just something about it that just works. But, you know, mm -hmm. ladies and gentlemen, you, th you think Jeremy Swift is a, a, an amazing actor, which he is. He's also an amazing musician, singer, and music producer. So we'll throw that one in there as well. Yep. But for you, are okay. you filming anything new now or something coming up? I'm filming a Disney thing at the moment um, in Atlanta um, and I'm playing Merlin, <laughs> Principal Merlin, um, uh, the magician. And I'm in talks about um, doing an independent uh, movie in Denver. 
So we'll see if that happens. Well, uh, well you have a busy yeah. year ahead of you, don't you? Could do, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, Jeremy, I want to thank you so much for coming on to the show. Oh, thank you so much. And um, yeah, go ahead. No, I, I, it's a, it's a, it's just such a nice, uh, so nice to have a good long chat. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, I'm sure a lot. I'm sure a lot of yours are probably what now two, three minutes long for the the Ted Lasso press. Yeah, that kind of thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Now, are you it's going nice to, to the Academy Awards on Sunday? I I'm not. No, although I have been invited to the the pre uh, pre award party, so I'll be going along to that. Hey, Which there you nice go. One. So, uh, you have any particular favorites you would like to see win on Sunday? Oh, wow. I, I loved Kate Blanchett in Tar. I thought she was incredible in that. And it was such an extraordinary film. I have to see it again. So haunting. Um, I loved The Fablemans. I loved The Whale. I loved everything, everywhere, all at once. Uh, it's been a great year for films. I yeah, think. I think this, you know, we were reviewing a lot of it for the past few weeks. And I think probably in the last five years, this has probably been the best crop of films, actors, and I can see where it's going to be an extremely tough choice for all the members of the Academy to be voting. So Sunday, yeah. I think, is going to be full of surprises. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, should be exciting. Absolutely. Yeah. And uh, ladies and gentlemen, Ted Lasso debuts March 15th on Apple TV. So our wait is finally over. So uh, <laughs> check out Jeremy Swift and also Hannah Waddington, of course, Jason Sudeikis, and the rest of the incredible cast of Ted Lasso. And again, it's been an absolute pleasure and an honor, Jeremy, to have you on the program. How kind. 